Welcome. In this episode, I'm going to be talking to Takara Shalor, um, and it's part of the uh, series that's uh, about the work of Stuart Wilde. So Takara talks about going on the Warriors in the Mist Stuart used to do in Dallas, New Mexico. And she explains the massive impact that had on her life and then her future work. So, without further ado... Today's episode, I'm going to be talking to Takara Shalor. Hi, Takara. Hi. Hi. Good to have you on. It's a nice signal as well, which is good. <laughs> nice clear picture. Um, okay, so my traditional first question is, what do you do? What do I do? So what I'm best known for is helping authors become bestsellers and to help individuals ignite their intuition and I help them find their diamonds and gold within, like their inner treasure, those, um, those like divine talents and gifts that they may not be aware that they have, and their passion and their purpose and their joy. That's mm. really what I help people with. Yeah. Cool. cool. So you, you sort of contacted me because I put some stuff out about the, the podcast I've done about Stuart, Stuart Wilde. Right. Um, and you were saying that you you know you knew him from the past so i was interested to know your story but obviously we need to have the you know how you got interested and found stuart in the first place right. so tell me about how that sort of developed what happened in your life from so you know i was this industrial engineer only female manager in a pharmaceutical manufacturing plant and i was under a lot of stress from the job, I had 40 people that reported to me. And because I was the only female manager, I had all this, you know, pressure mm -hmm. and I, it was too much. Like I took everything personally and I was trying to do it the best. And, you know, it was just too much. And all of a sudden, because of all this pressure, one day I woke up not feeling well. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I knew, I was having flashbacks of being raped oh. and you know, it was pretty traumatic. Mm -hmm. And so like I, it happened 15 years before. So I had been in 15 years of denial, which is a really long time. Um, I let my boss know what was happening, that I was not going to be at work, you know, and, and he pointed me toward like, get some psychiatric help because something that I didn't know about people who have denial that long often become suicidal. I wasn't thankfully, Right. But that's that was the fear from, the, you know, the people that were trying to help me. And so I started seeing somebody professionally, you know, and I mean, it was helpful. I got a, They taught me to journal and I read a couple of books and, you know, but what I really suddenly started happening was. All of a sudden, when I when I let out this memory, I also opened up my intuition and I just suddenly felt drawn to go here or there. And I was feeling this super desire to go into a new age bookstore, mm -hmm. but I would have never done that before. I grew oh, up my mother's, my mother's Southern Baptist. Like you yeah. don't go places, you don't go places like that. Right. No, you no, just no. don't. But I did, I walked in the store and I was looking around at all these books, you know, and I thought I was pretty well read, but I'd never heard of anything in any, I had never heard of any of the stuff in there. No. You know, they were talking about herbs and they were talking about astrology and like all these things. I read, I think, every title on every book in the whole place. Like I just was going around and going around. And finally, I was literally on my hands and knees on the very bottom, like upside down, trying to read the very bottom row. And Stuart Wilde's stuff was right there. Yes. As and it this would be. one, yeah. As it right, right. Put his stuff down. And yeah. this one book, the second I saw the title, the name of it, I got tears just from seeing the name affirmations. I was like, why would I cry with that? Right. So I bought that book. I took that book home. I read that book that afternoon. It was, it was, it changed my life because he was exactly what I needed to hear in that moment. 
You know, he had such a brilliant and humorous way of dissecting the, the absurdity of religion, you know, and, and what I had been in, inundated with as a child, it's exactly how I needed to unpack all that and, and, you know, move beyond all that. So I then went back and I bought every other book they had by him. And I just became quite a follower. Um, and then I re- discovered that he had audio tapes, you know, this is back in the cassette days, you know, this was a long time ago. And so, because I was still working the job after about three months of being off and like putting myself back together, I had to go back to work. And what I started doing was I would put in one of Stuart's tapes. I had a 20 minute drive. So for 20 minutes, I would listen to him. And then at lunch, I would leave work and I would go to a little park and I would read his books and then coming home, I'd listen to him again. And so I just was inundated. I just, I just became this absorbing sponge of his information and his wisdom. And I became a completely different person. You know, I found inner peace. I started meditating. I followed all his advice, you know, and it, and it was really amazing. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. This isn't it that, um, you know, because obviously you're you're not the first bo- person I've spoken to about Stuart. I'm um, sure, yeah. And um, I always find it fascinating when somebody can can you know they, they sort of open doorways like that. Um, it's quite remarkable, really, and and interesting that you found him in the way that you did. Yeah. You know, um, because I don't think. Well, I don't know. It's difficult to say this, isn't it? But unless you've got You've got to you've got to get something sorted. Have you seen yes. I mean? um, Yeah. There's there's no there's no sort of two ways about it. You're in a in a situation where you, that you've got to deal with that. You've got to find an answer. Yeah. Um, and then once that once you do that, it really transforms transforms your life. So I'm, right. I'm gathering that the the person that you sort of started to become is very different from the person you've been before. Is that a safe? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And as that continued, you know, who I am now is radically different, even from that person, you know, I've just continued to evolve. Like I started, I took up the path, man. I got, I got serious about personal evolution, personal empowerment, and, you know, the whole ascension path and all that. Something I want to say about what you were describing though, is, you know, I don't know if Stuart said it or if I came up with it, but that moment, where you have to deal with something it's in your face. I call it the metaphysical two by four upside the head, you know, because you can't ignore it. It's something so in your face, you can't ignore it. And some people manage somehow to ignore it a little bit. So they get slammed a second time, you know, because eventually you just get slammed. Um, Yeah. 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 Stuart has got a term i can't remember exactly what it is about being smacked around the head by a bat or something yeah 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 but um yeah i think that's the thing that you know you we can go so far and you see this with with people's lives anyway can't you where they're doing something and suddenly they get ill right it's quite, it's quite a common thing and it stops yeah. them in the tracks you know yep. uh and the point is that you've got to take notes of that it's not just a case of just getting back on your feet again and just carrying on doing the same thing Right. Because you end up even worse later down yeah. the line. Yeah. I think that's a fair comment. Um, and again, maybe that's sort of in the in the world of you know, the logical world. You can't see any reason why that's not a good thing to do. But of course, it's, when you sort of look at it from the point of view that you're being told in no uncertain terms that, you know, it's time for a change. <laughs> um and I think that's when when interesting things start to happen. Yeah. So once you started reading those books and you realised that things were beginning to change, what was the next? What was the next thing that happened? Did you? you, so, you so so two more things happened. Um, I was I, I knew some people who the husband also followed Stuart, like really liked his work as well, and they this couple let me know that Stuart was going to be in Princeton. And I was living in Pennsylvania at the time. I don't know how, you know, it was three or four hour drive or whatever. But as soon as I found out, oh, my gosh, you know, this guy from England that I follow is going to be is going to be in, you know, not that far away. I drove up there and spent the afternoon listening to him 
And then my friend and I um, went out to eat afterwards. And but at the at that event, it, first of all, I have to say I was surprised by his appearance. Right? <laughs> I was surprised yes. by his because he had you know you see the pictures where he that were taken at Taos with him on a horse or something yeah. you know and a dog and and he's this thinner guy and he's you know but this man was wearing a bright red sweater. And he had this giant belly, like giant. I was like, why would you wear red? <laughs> like it was like a neon. Sign. It was surprising to me because, you know, I was reading about all the disciplines that yeah. he was recommending, right? Food discipline and getting up and meditating and stuff. So I was like, wow. It, and, the, you know, as you follow him, you realize there's so many dichotomies, yes. right? He'll say this in one moment, he'll say something else in another. And that was just, I found it delightful. But it was surprising. So anyway, they had brochures there for Warriors in the Mist. You know, when I'm an engineer and I got tons of money and I'm like, heck, yeah, you know. So I signed up for Warriors in the Mist and I got a personal trainer because it was going to be at high elevation. We were going to be doing physical things like I was taking it seriously. And um, and I showed up at Warriors in the Mist for eight days to hang out with him and a bunch of other very cool people from all over the globe. You know, I found out that Wayne Dyer and his wife had been there the week before at the other, you know, the one previous. And in this particular one, I think it was the drummer for you. The, the Eurythmics was there. Taking, taking oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it was people from everywhere. My roommate was from Australia, you know, um, and we were separated into our bands, which is, you know, Mongolian fighting oh, yeah. unit, which Stuart was all into all that, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so you met these people, you happened to sit on the same bench the first night when they lined you up. And that was your group that you're going to stay with for the rest of the week. And so we did all these exercises, you know, we, we rode horses bareback and blindfolded. We, you know, we did a ton of stuff, a lot of ropes, things we did, um, trance dance. Like there was just all this stuff. And twice a day, Stuart taught us, you know, there was a teaching in the morning and in the evening there was a teaching, but also a, a meditation that he led, you know? Um, and then at one point uh, in the very beginning, so Stuart, like, oh my gosh, you know, we're all sort of in awe of the man. Right. And now he's in, he's here and you know, he does crazy stuff. So you're kind of afraid, you know, <laughs> you're excited and afraid all at the same time, not knowing you have any idea what's about to happen. But like the very first morning after the night before we were put into your group, they get you up freaking early in the morning. And the rules are whenever you're in motion, you're not allowed to speak. You have to be in silence. And so you can't talk to anybody about wonder what's going to happen or, you know, so they take you into this kind of dark room and there's, they have X's on the floor and you have to stand there and somebody comes down the hall and bows to one of you and you have to follow them down the hall. And then you never see that person again. <laughs> You're like what is going on? You know? And when it was my turn, it was Stuart that came to get me. So I'm like bowing to my teacher, you know, and I follow him down the hall and they take you in this room and there's this massive spotlight. And they shove it, they shove a microphone in your face and they want to tell you to tell them about your life. It was like an interrogation room. I almost busted out laughing. It was so classic Stuart, you know, I loved the whole thing. But so they were taking this video and in each one, I don't know how long you talked, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it was. And then later in the week, your R band got together and Stuart played each of the videos for you individually, but also for your whole group. And then he talked to you individually. And the thing that he said to me was, you seem very happy and, you know, well-adjusted because he'd helped me change my life, right? I really was. But then he stopped and he looked at me and he goes, where do you live? And I said, Pennsylvania. And he just said, Pennsylvania is an ingrown toenail. And I fell off my chair laughing because to me, it really was, it was that constrictive and it was all people that were farm people in the middle of Pennsylvania, Dutch country. There's nothing wrong with these people, but they were all, it was very homogenized. There was no diversity. There was no, they all thought the same way. They all had the same background. That's not who I am. 
you know, and, and it was very constrictive for me. And he was like, I had to go West. So not long after that, I went West, <laughs> you know, I quit that job. I moved to the San Juan islands. I started a nonprofit for dolphins and whales with a woman I met there who was in my R band. Um, and that was another journey all of on its own, but that's kind of how I got out of corporate life and went on to do other things. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, the, he, you know, he, he did have a extraordinary way of being able to sort of read people, yeah. which um, and put put you on the spot. Uh, he'd say something that could quite take you back. Um, yeah. So I'm just wondering, what was the feeling about that when you when he did that? Because we often said- talk about the language and everything, don't we? But yeah. You know, what is it about that when you talk to somebody and they sort of, they're reading you? What, what, what's the feeling that you get with that? Well, there's two feelings that you get. I mean, in any kind of encounter like that, not just with Stuart doing it, but in general, you know, you feel a little naked, mm. you know, you feel, you feel seen and maybe things you don't want people to know. You know what I mean? We all have those we're trying to put the facade on of whatever, but, but with him, it, it was, I, I don't know. I felt, I almost felt embraced. I almost felt fully understood. Um, and, and, it, you know, we, he, he had pointed out something that I wasn't even discussing, you know, he picked it up and he realized that in this part of your life, you're feeling constricted and that's not what you want, you know, and later on different people have, have said that I'm kind of like a, a wild Mustang, you know, freedom is important and the ability to run and do what you want and express yourself the way you want to is pretty important to me. So like he had picked up on all that. So I felt, I felt, um, I felt acknowledged and I felt seen and this suggestion go West. I found very exciting because I always felt drawn to the Southwest and I eventually ended up living in Santa Fe later. So, you know, it, it, it felt important, but at the time, I don't know, it was so many things, just being in his presence was a big deal for me, you know, um, being in New Mexico. I mean, I felt so in love with the place he held it that I ended up moving to New Mexico, you know? Um, but it was, yeah, I would say seen and, and acknowledged and really understood. Mm. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the things that you've mentioned um, about, you know, riding horses bareback with blindfolds, sort of, you sort of look at that and you think, mm, health and safety. Um, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, I know. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, I That's know. what I'll it's tell it's- you. Yeah, but here's what I'll tell you. You didn't know at the time because of the way they did it, but there was somebody leading the horse. Yes. yeah. But we didn't know that. No. You know, you couldn't hear them. They were wearing moccasins or something. I'm, I don't remember exactly. I was actually surprised when I realized it was when they said, take off the, the thing. And you, there's a person there holding the horse. I'm like, who knew, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. but the, obviously the, the effect of that, because you didn't know. Yeah. It was profound really, wasn't it? Yes, yes, yes. And so it's all about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm because obviously, well, because obviously we go and ask you. It's difficult to work out how he got those ideas. Because um, I was talking to somebody who their first, well, not their first experience, but one of their early experiences w- with him was doing a fire walk, walk and mm-hmm. he was doing this well before anybody else had taken that out and sort of used that in the West type of idea, you know, it was right. outside of its, its context um, in, in a, in a car park in, in, in London, as, you know, in the middle of, in the middle of London. As, yeah. as you um, and it's sort of like, it was sort of on, on things very early. Um, and I'm quite intrigued by how, how he, you know, where, how he got those ideas down and, and who he knew. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, some of those, those things are incredibly well thought through. I, I, that sounds a bit weird because it's almost like it isn't thought through, but it is thought right. through from the point of view of, like, the, the effect of the, 
the experience. You know, like really? like it. Like it I want, I'll use the word initiation very loosely, but you understand what I'm sort of saying. Absolutely, absolutely. But But can I jump in for a second and say something about it? So so here's what happens happens for me. You know, at his suggestion, I began meditating daily. Hmm. You know, and back in the day when I was trying to really change my life, I got up religiously at 4 a.m. and I meditated for, you know, for two and a half years, I did that every day. Um, And then I kind of was like, okay, enough of this. (laughs) You know, and I did it in what I consider a more reasonable hour. But what I do now is I still meditate every day. And I have two different forms of meditation that I do back to back. And then I have to write things down. And insights like what you're discussing are things that come to me. This is what I should include in a workshop. This is not what I should include in a book. You know, I would say maybe he just got flashes of inspiration because he was very, very tapped in. Then you have to go investigate it. Okay, how, what would that look like? And you have to work out the logistics of it and all of that. But it's quite possible it was just divine inspiration. Yeah, it could be. It that could gave be. him those ideas. Yes, it could be. And that's obviously I'm particularly interested in, in that because of most of the podcasts I'm, I'm doing about creativity. And, and that's one of the, the things that I'm sort of also trying to tap into with it. Yes, yes. It because, um, you know, People, the people who know him will know him from from books probably now, um, but obviously, as you say, there was all these tapes and you know recordings of him and, and stuff like that. But I was particularly impressed by the, the sort of musical stuff that he ended yeah. up getting involved with. Yeah, you know, and it might be to do with the fact that he'd written some of the the um, sort, of, if you like, the libretto, if you, for want of a better word, but. He did have a sort of a feel for for that sort of stuff, which mm-hmm. when you look at it, that's that's so it's so diverse, right? Um, and also, he uh, the other thing he could do. I mean, apart from the fact he was a great raconteur, and he could have been a fantastic stand-up comedian, there's no yeah, yeah. There's no doubt about that. Um, but it's that sort of ability to sort of think outside the box and 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 obviously you know the the conversation that i had with his his sister Didi was that he was an incredibly good businessman mm-hmm. as well which is right. you know when you and obviously you're involved in doing that type of thing for people there there are although there is a link it's not a link that happens all the time with people no. you get a lot of people that are quite inspired and quite you know, this, you know, psychic or whatever, but they're absolutely rubbish with money. <laughs> yes, yes. And if you see what I mean. Yes. And a similar thing I've seen often, it's I almost call them like tormented artists, you know. There's there's this, you know, so creative that they're not nailed down, you know, they're not grounded in, and they're not very good in the 3D life. They're not, you know, they're they're not good with finances. They're not necessarily great with relationships. They're, you know, they, they can sometimes just be so into their art, so into their expression, whether it's music or painting or whatever it might be, but th- that there isn't this balance, you know, but I, you know, with, when you look at what he taught with like Taoism and you look at that whole Asian piece, um, you know, I got into Chinese medicine early on to help my own health. It really did, but it talks all about balance. You get that yin yang thing going on, you know? So when you, when you look at the body, mind, spirit of what he was teaching and holistic living, it was all about finding balance. And, and so if you're going to do this, you kind of have to do that. You know, it's all, and the bit for me too, the business part is not, I do it. I understand it. I help people with some marketing and things, but I am far more creative than I am fabulous at, at finances for, let's say. So, you know, for me, it kind of leans this way with creativity, but, but I do work hard to do this. And my engineering background helps me a lot to think logically, you know, I kind of think if I hadn't gone in, down that path, I may not be as good in both worlds. Cause I, it's so easy to stay in the other world you know, and it like I'm Pisces. We love just being in a meditation in another realm. Like we would much rather do that than deal with 3D life, you know, so. The the thing is that maybe 
like yourself, you talk about your engineering background and the fact that there's got to be, there's a logical basis, right, to that. That becomes like maybe automatic, a default setting that yeah. you can do that. And that, and it may not appear so much that you're having to do this, that sort of thing, because it's already there. For a lot of artistic people, that might not necessarily be their default. Right. You know? And obviously with Stuart, from, you know, from what I've sort of gleaned about this sort of early part of his life, that he was very good at being able to see opportunity in, in yeah. certain things and, yeah. and sort of do that. And I've, I've spoken to a lot of other people who are just very, very good entrepreneurial minds and, mm -hmm. and they can just see something and they just, yeah. they just know that, that yeah. that's going to work. And, they, and, and I often sort of say it's like what we used to call working it out on the back of a fag packet type of thing where you, the, the numbers are very just, I do this and that and that gives me this and then it's going to come to blah, blah, bang. Done. Right, right, right. Um, and it's like it's a sort of a guesstimate, you know, of how yeah. things will work, and and that happens very quickly with that type of person, that, mm. that type of thinking, to the point that they don't, they might not even realise they do it. Right, right. So, um, then I'm only suggesting that that might be what what was going on, you know, with maybe for Stuart that he appeared. That those things were just like second nature. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. And listening to that interview you did with his sister, you know, she said right away he was already doing that even in school. You know, so yeah, he clearly had that. He was he was leaning in that way already. It was just how he was thinking, and and that started early. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So let's you. I, I was going to say it's always sort of difficult to land after doing something like uh, something like that. So, what happened directly after? You said you 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 sort of planned I quickly to moved. Yeah, I moved really fast. I think we, I'm trying to think. It was less than. It was like a year later or less. It was. I went to Stewart's thing in '95. And in 96, I was already living in the San Juans, you know, so it was six months a year, probably less than a year. Um, yeah, I, I just couldn't be there different. anymore. I just couldn't yeah. be there anymore. You know, no. I already knew. I mean, you know, I, it wasn't like he told me to do this and I did it and it wasn't really didn't feel right. It was like I already was feeling it. You know, I already knew I didn't fit. I mean, I was working in pharmaceuticals. I was in charge of making sure that America had bare aspirin. <laughs> okay. And I had already turned my health into holistic health and I was eating healthy and organic and all that. So it was already sort of against what I was believing in already. So, I mean, that was already going on. So him suggesting I try something else was kind of the impetus I needed to have the courage to take the step I probably already needed to take. But um, I mean, it was still scary, but it was very exciting. And um, but I just couldn't fit in anymore there, you yeah. know? And, yeah. and so, yeah, it was, it, it's kind of like when you expand your consciousness, your awareness, whatever, and you try to come back and shove it all back into the little package. It just, just doesn't really work anymore. You no, know? it doesn't. I, I mean, I've, I, I'm just, I do, obviously I do a lot of sort of teaching work and stuff. And, and one of the things that I've always found interesting is there seems to be, I call it, it's like set point theory, right? It's this idea that, I mean, this was something that was sort of coined about people who went on diets and they'd lose a load of weight and they come off the diet and they come, they, they go back to the weight they were before. Right. So it's almost as if there was a natural set point about where they were. Um, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guitarist and um, one of the interesting sort of phenomena is when you put a, guitar strings on a guitar, particularly if they're like classical strings. You, you tune them up and they go out of tune. You tune them up, they go out of tune. And they yeah. have to settle in. And the trick is to over-tighten. Oh. So that what happens is that as they settle down, they settle into tune. So it's like you've got to go further yep. from where you need to be. And that seems to be something that works it's almost like it is a natural phenomena somehow. 
Yeah. But if you wanted to lose weight, you, you need to lose more weight than you actually want to lose. You know, you want to be, there's your ideal weight, but you actually need to lose more. And then gradually you increase into what yeah. it is that you want. Right. You know, um, and same thing with things like fitness and all the rest of it. You know, maybe that's the sort of thing where you have to sort of push it a little bit further in order to, when you, you, you know, you sort of settle back in. That's where right. you go. And um, so I've always been intrigued by change because most people don't actually change, do they? Yeah. If you see no, what I mean. they don't. No, they don't. And yeah. I was wondering if that's part of that. And you might be a good person to talk about that because obviously now yeah. you're coaching people and stuff. Yeah, I definitely coach people and teach people and write books and all that about these sort of things. And, it, you know, there's, um, I'm trying to, I forget the actual terms, okay, but there's what's called fixed mindset and growth mindset. Those might not be the correct terms that are being used today in the world, right? But um, when you think your life is okay and you want things to stay the same, and especially if you're into trying to control how your life is, which happens a lot for people that have issues that they don't want to deal with. They're trying to compartmentalize and they're trying to make their life work the way they want it to. Um, For those people, which I was one of them, right? The thing that forces you to change has to be so catastrophic. You can't, you can't not address it like we mentioned. And so once that it's like an egg. And once the egg cracks, it's cracked. <laughs> there's no way to put it all the, the, you know, the egg will not go back together. So there's, that's one way, you know, I actually do believe it's possible to take incremental changes, doing smaller shifts and over time, just going outside your comfort zone slightly, yeah. you yeah. know, and, and so over time people evolve. And I think it's, there's two different people yeah. because truthfully, I'm a very kind of radical person. Like I take monumental risks and I, t- I make monumental changes because I want to go far and I want to go fast. Right. So that catastrophic way was my way. Very few people are comfortable with that. Very few people. Right. And, and I think my desire to sh- change my life and find happiness had to be so great that I was willing to do different things in a normal and go outside my comfort zone and meet people and do things, read things and take classes and, you know, just go a whole other way because I was that unhappy. Like I was just that dissatisfied. Um, so when a person is that dissatisfied and they find some, someone like myself or any other person that helps people, they can go really far because they're at that level of dissatisfaction. But for other people, you almost have to coax them. <laughs> They have to be coaxed into, okay, I'm going to take this baby step and just make sure they feel okay. 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 I took this step. I was not comfortable, but I took it and I didn't die, you know? So, so now, okay. Okay. That wasn't so bad. They go much slower. I don't think either way is right or wrong. It's, you know, but some people never do. Some people are just so, I think it's fear-based so afraid of change because they they're just so that afraid of the unknown that okay. it's hard yes. sorry. sorry i interrupted you Karen. go ahead no um there's something interesting with that what you're saying about fear um i read something by um a guy called um ramsey jukes actually it's lionel snell is his his, his name but he writes under the uh, pen name of Ramsey Jukes. And um, he's a sort of, he's a magician, uh, he's a sort of chaos magician. He's one of the sort of early, early sort of uh, um, names, you know. And in this particular book, he was talking about hypnosis. Um, and he, he was saying that when he was at, I, I can't remember if he was at Oxford or at Cambridge, but they had a stage, no, sorry, a, a medical hypnotist come in to demonstrate hypnosis. So there they are in a university that, and I think he was he was studying mathematics or something. So lots of very rational people in a room, and he describes this event 
where the guy's put into hypnosis and they make the person next to him sort of disappear, you know, like the guy's not there anymore. So he said, you know, the, the thing is, so where's John gone? So the guy under hypnosis says, oh, he must have gone out. And then he brings him back. Uh, it's John, you know, John's there. So, so what happened to John? Well, John's come back. It's all very rational. And this is under hypnosis. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Until under hypnosis, he makes half of John disappear. Oh. And the guy virtually has a nervous breakdown. Yeah, yeah. And he described the situation about logic, the logical, rational mind, that if anything breaks in the system, the yeah. whole lot collapses. And he, and he explains it in numbers, like if two suddenly, you know, if, if two and two do not equal four anymore, that they equal, you know, two, zero, then two plus two equals two, you know, and, and then suddenly he, he, he takes this set of mathematical calculations and you realise just one thing changing collapses the whole system. And he was sort of suggesting that maybe that's what happens with people, that the fear mm -hmm. that if anything breaks their con construct of how the world works, yep. that's terrifying. Yeah. Because it suddenly means that nothing yeah. is reliable anymore. Exactly. And, and that really sort of had an effect on me about that sort of the psychological aspect about how people the familiarity of something, even if it's an illness, it's familiar. Yeah. So they don't really want to get better. They think they no. want to. Get better, right. They, and you must have experienced this where people. Absolutely. Come again and again, and again with, with clients, with people, I, you know, lots of people that I work with and, and talking with other people that assist people. It's the same phenomena across the board. There are people that in, a lot of them have had that egg crack thing. They've almost had a breakdown. I definitely, I had a mental breakdown when the, the rape thing happened and I was crumpled in the floor crying and stuff. That was definitely a mental breakdown. And it made, and, and the thing in that moment for me was I suddenly was feeling feelings I'd never felt before. I was suddenly afraid. I was suddenly angry, like raging in anger. And I'd never felt that before because in my house that you didn't raise your voice. No one yelled. It, you weren't allowed. So it was all stuffed in there somehow, you know, but when it all came tumbling out, all these feelings that I was feeling were very, um, um, I, I never, it was foreign, you know, it was foreign to me. And so in that moment, I had this realization that if these are part of who I am, I don't really know myself. And that's how I, even in that moment of it was awful and having these memories, knew that, oh, my God, this is what I've been waiting for because I wasn't happy and I knew I wasn't happy. So if this is what the problem is, we could solve it now, you know, and so I, it was OK with me that I was going through these tormental, you know, horrible feelings because I knew it meant I could get out to the other side and life was going to change for me. And so that's even in the worst of it, I was still hopeful. You know, uh, that's that's amazing because it takes a lot of brave thinking to be able to deal with that yeah, aspect yeah. in in the in the middle of it all. You know, right, you, right. When you hit rock bottom and you think, well, can't get any worse than this. Right. It's it's time to start climbing out of the hole. <laughs> Let's climb this sucker, right? Let's yeah, exactly. strap yeah. on the stuff and go up the cliff and let not take. Let's take the escalator or the or the you know elevator. Let's not pussyfoot around let's get, exactly. get on with it you know and i think that's the thing about you're saying about the the thing that stuart was that that you attended stuart did that's that thing of making you feel oh my god i did that and i didn't realize i could do that which makes you feel gives you some sort of strength inside doesn't yeah, it yeah yeah and and he was really great i mean we, and we knew this going in you know it's all about breaking up your paradigms you ate at different times than normal. You slept at different times than normal. You, they were getting you up at four in the morning. They were having you do unusual things, you know, but he also had us doing some very empowering things. Like we did, um, I think it was Taekwondo. 
Oh, okay. okay. And my partner, I'm five foot four inches. I don't know what that is in centimeters. Sorry. No, but, no, I don't do. I don't do you, money. I only do. Okay. Old, yeah, yeah. So, five so foot four is good to me. Five foot four inches for whoever you know. But the guy that was my partner, mm. one of the members of my R band, he was like six three or six four. Big guy. And in this Taekwondo course, because we did it every morning as part of our training in the morning. In one moment, they showed us this move and I was able to take him down and he couldn't get up. And it didn't took a lot of my lot of strength. It was a technique that you did something with the wrist or I, like, I don't even remember, you know, but I think that was having been raped, right. That I had remembered. That was probably the first time ever as a female, I felt empowered and like, oh, I'm not this vulnerable, small, you know, I, I don't know if you can see my wrist. I don't weigh anything, right? I'm a really tiny person. So there's this feeling of vulnerability that comes with that. And being female is the same story. But in that moment, I was like, oh my God, I have power, you know? And I think that was probably the moment I started feeling more empowered and have continued that until even today, feeling more and more and more empowered. And I help women do the same, right? But he also had us doing etheric things where you, you were reaching out and touching stuff and you're, you know, it, it, all of it was designed to help you feel more powerful yes. and, and more wise and more and expand not only your, your what's possible, but also energetically expanding yourself, you know, mm. it was pushing boundaries all the time mm. and, and you were blasting through them with him, with his guidance, you know? It's powerful. Yes, it, it it is because obviously a lot of people. I have quite a diverse listenership of people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously some people can really get what you're saying there, and other people is a bit like, well, you know, because they're coming out of a logical thing. But again, you know, if you even if you go down the logical route and think, well, your mind frame of what you believe is possible immediately limits you. Right. As, as soon as you go, that does not exist. You will never see that thing. You get the, you know, it's the black swan. Right, right, you know, right. There are no such things as black swans. Um, and it's not until suddenly you see one that it's like, ah, okay. So there are. Um, and they've always been. Um, it's just, I didn't believe that they existed. Right, right. And we do that all the time. Yeah. Uh, and then it's like the most obvious things in retrospect, you never saw coming. And I think all of those exercises are, are great at being able to get you to observe things. Because most of the time we don't actually see things, do we? I mean, this is one of the right. interesting things. Oh, yeah. Things. You know, when we look at the world, we think we see what there is, but we actually only see a tiny bit of what there is and, and everything else is made up by the mind, you know. <laughs> So if you don't think that something's there, you just don't see it. Um, right. And and that sort of, that really fascinates me about things. And that mindset then goes into things like, I've just done a thing about seeing opportunity. Right. And there are some people, and you obviously be aware of this, there are some people who just see opportunity. It's just right. there. You, right. you could do that. And somebody else is like, oh, I never thought of that. Right. 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 And all of that sort of thinking that Stuart was doing is like that, isn't it? It's that sort yeah. of thing. You've got the ability okay. for all these things to happen, you yeah. know, that you're empowered in all, you know, and more aware of the world and, and everything. So, right. and I think that's, that's an interesting thing and, and quite, uh, uh, quite earth shattering when it. <laughs> Indeed. Think, oh, okay. So it's down to me. <laughs> Indeed. So something I want to share about that is, you know, something that came to me one day is that what most people do, I mean, there's a way to show it. Okay. So what a lot of people do is they're faced with a problem. So they go like this and they're only looking at the problem. And that's why they don't see the opportunities. You know, they're so focused, like, oh my God, oh my God, or, you know, whatever they say, it's like, they're so focused on the problem that no opportunity exists for them to change anything. You know, and when, but when you do kind of the practices that he recommends and others that I recommend, it's like 
you, you, you don't focus on this. In fact, you divert your eyes from that, right? You get off of that already. You know, it's there. It's not going away. Okay, fine. Let's not just stay there. But it's like you open and you, it's like you open up and, and there's like 20 different answers, but it requires that you come back into harmony and balance within, you know, when you're freaked out, when you're totally in like that beta brainwave and you're like all in freak out mode, there is no way to see opportunity, but the more centered and balanced and still within that you are, the more really in tune and grounded with like, you're connected to the earth, but you're also in tune with the universe. When you've got that expanded state of consciousness going, there are infinite possibilities, mm. you know, mm. but it requires that you stay in those moments of stillness. And so the second for me and people have been around me, they see me do it and they're like, wow, how did you do that? But it's like the second that something unexpected happens, the car breaks down, you know, whatever. Um, I just pull it all in. Like, instead of going, oh my God, and like being out here and all emotional, I like bring it in. No opinion, no emotion. I like suck it all in. And I'm like, okay, just, I just ground in the moment. And I'm like, okay, this moment doesn't look the way I thought it would look. What am I to do right now? And from that really still centered place, I get amazing answers. And I'm like, okay, we're going to do this. And it's easy, you know, instead of like, flying off and having the whole day ruined and you know because that's how most people operate it is um it's a bit like you know if it's the world reflects what you're thinking back to you i think that's a fair comment we've all experienced that i mean the i always use the analogy of if people decide that you know they want to buy a new car or something and they've decided they want a blue whatever it is they go out the next day and there's one. Oh, and there's another one. And yes. you start seeing it. And it's, and it's that sort of thing where, you know, you, you're already alert to whatever that is that you've decided upon. Right. The problem is if what you're, you're being alert to is the problem, yeah, that's all you're ever going to see. Yeah. You know? and, uh, and I think that's, that's very important. So the point is it's like readjusting that, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Getting that moment of sort of bringing yourself back. Uh, so that you can, you know, uh, you know, sort of re, how can you put, recalibrate. For one of the yeah, words. yeah. And I think, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, because one of the things that sort of crossed my mind when you were talking about beta and, you know, alpha and all that sort of stuff, was, um, was Stuart using sort of metronomes? Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. I mean, theta is the key. And I still, like, I came to that conclusion. Stu- Stuart came to that conclusion. Lots of, you know, even I found out, cause I wrote a book, best-selling book on meditation. Okay. And it, yeah. lots it of different, it peering it through the veil, right. peering through the veil. So I in, include in there a whole bunch of different forms of meditation. And then when it was, I don't know how many years old, I updated it. And I did a lot more research on like brain waves and stuff. And I wanted to include a lot more science in it. And so I looked at shamanic drumming, you know, because Stuart had a lot to do with shamanism and he always had a guy do a sweat lodge. And, and, you know, when we came down from the hill from our vision quest, which is also, you know, Native American kind of tradition, we were all gifted with a, um, a, a Taos drum, you know, which we then painted the next day with the vision that we had. And, but the drumbeat done traditionally in the Native American way, or probably around the world, gets you into theta. They've done studies and they've proven that, you know, so theta for eons, people have known getting into theta is the answer. And, you know, I I know Stuart said it at some point, but he was talking about, and I know for sure, because I can feel it in my body. When you get into a theta brain weight, you disconnect from your emotions. So because I used to listen to the metronome all the time, just like he did, I can go into it with my eyes open. So that's exactly what I'm doing in those moments. When I'm pulling back, I'm dropping into a theta brainwave. So I don't have to deal with all my emotions going crazy. I can just go with, you know, an open mindset. And, and so, yeah, he, he was definitely doing the metronome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I think this, 
Um, okay, that's a bit of cherry picking, but you know, you know what I mean? It's that sort of thing of there are certain things that you can do yeah. that assist. Um, right. So right. That's, an, that's a really important um, aspect of some of that sort of work. So when you tell me a little bit about what you did then from after you, you, you moved Right. Um, so, so after I went to the San Juans, like I said, with the lady that I met at Stewart's event and we started a nonprofit for dolphins and whales because I had a vision previously in meditation where dolphins showed up. And so, you know, I have a lot, I know I wear dolphins, you know, I I'm involved with that, but, um, then we moved to California, this woman and I, that because the San Juans, you have to take a boat to do anything to even get good groceries. You know, we, we felt like we couldn't take the business or the nonprofit where we wanted. And so we moved to Southern California. And while I was there, I met my future husband and the woman ended off going off to Hawaii. And so we just sort of dissolved the nonprofit and I moved to Canada and had a baby at home alone with only the dad present in water. So I went into a theta brainwave having a baby and I didn't have pain. That was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I didn't like Canada. It was too cold. There's too much snow. It's not my terrain. And it so it was, yes. yeah, it was then that we moved to New Mexico. And so I, I ran a shamanic healing center in Santa Fe for like 10 years. Um, and when my then husband and I were separating, um, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. And so I brought my son to Virginia and cared for my parents. Um, and it was, you know, it was a really good thing. So then I started teaching locally and, you know, taught advanced energy healing techniques locally. And, you know, I've continued to write books and, and do all sorts of things. So I have four best selling books. Um, my most recent is called Unleash Your Future. And it's all about manifesting and how manifesting really works. It right. was endorsed by Jack Canfield. So, you know, and it's, um, it's a collaboration with one other person. Um, and so he's a scientist and I've, you know, even though my background's engineering, I am much more of the spiritual side of the equation, you know, and so together we brought it together and, and really explain it. Um, and so now I, you know, I'm, I teach advanced energy healing. I teach like what, what Stuart taught me when, when I was at Sipapu, which is the place in New Mexico, during my vision, I had a download of information and that has continued to now and, and new information is coming in now. And so I'm developing a whole healing methodology, really, that it's like a bridge for people, it's about intuition, but it's like, you know, when people are just learning to utilize their intuition, they don't, you know, they might hear something, but they're not sure if they can trust it and whatever. And I've, I've created a bridge using dowsing. Right. Where it's okay. like, okay, you're getting this, you're feeling this. Okay. I've got 8 million charts. So you can walk through 8 million is an exaggeration, of course, but there's a series of charts where, you know, these I'm looking for the root cause of an issue. And I'm literally have a list of what are the root causes of issues. And then you can drill down and how to address them, whether it's with energy healing or herbs or seeing a doctor or, you know, like I talk about all of it. So I'm helping people go from having no idea to being self-empowered with this tool. So that's really where my focus is right now in developing this. But it all began right. back then. It yeah. began yeah. with that being on that mountain. And I even went back to that mountain where Stuart wrote the Taos Quintet, right? Back at Sipapu at this rustic resort. I went back there and I wrote a whole, a whole thing there too. I went into a trance, Go. I went into Theta. I sat by the stream there sitting at a, um, a table, there's like pygmy tables or whatever. And just listening to the water tumbling over the rocks. That's my, you know, I'm Pisces, the water works for me. I, I go into a deep state and I just wrote just sort of like automatic writing. I wrote for about three or four days. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm putting that training together as well. It's a whole, again, another kind of healing technology. That's amazing. I mean, the, the amazing sort of lasting impact. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, that's a, it's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant uh, story. It's very encouraging for people. Um, and I think, obviously, we're, 
we're in very sort of weird times, which is sort of slightly um, expected, I think is the best way to yeah. put it. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. Not like, it's not like, oh, my God, this was we didn't see this coming. It's almost like, oh, yes, we definitely did see this coming. Um, right. You know, obviously, it's all, I mean, there's so many, obviously, a lot of things that Stuart said, you look at and you think, mm, yeah, you're not necessarily quite because you wouldn't know. It's like a lot of things, That's isn't right. it? With um, when you sort of look ahead and you just get a feel and you know roughly what the dynamic is, but it doesn't necessarily it won't necessarily manifest in exactly how you see it. But you, you exactly, exactly, the undercurrent of it is definitely there, right? So we we are definitely in a place that was coming. You see what right, I mean? Right, right. So yeah, interesting times. Absolutely. Right. Well, that that's that was brilliant, Takara. That, that was very very interesting. And thanks for sharing all of that. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's been really fun. Yeah, it's, it has been really good. And and I think that's it's a nice um, it's a nice thing to sort of think about. Different, you know, different people have different stories. Right. So, um, but I think that that sort of thing about how powerful that can be. You know, experiences like that, particularly when you've had a trauma right right but I mean you know he well and the other thing too is you know I studied him I did eight days since uh, warriors in the mist I continued to study and even teach some of his stuff and then a whole period of time happened where I just did my own thing and wasn't really thinking about him and then all of a sudden I'm thinking about him again and so I started listening to his audio tapes again. I'm reading some of the newer material that I hadn't really read, you know? Um, and, and it's like, so it's, it's like, it came back around mm. and it's time to go deeper into what he was really trying to say. Mm. Um, you know, and I, I know it sounds really weird, but I do kind of sense him around sometimes mm. and, and, um, whether it's just my connection was so deep because I so fully immersed myself in it but you know, the teaching still has value. There's a lot there. Even some of my students, they're doing what I did. They're listening to the audio tapes again, you know, now they're like MP3 downloads, right? but, yeah. but it's still, they're still available and they're still yeah. quite good. So. Yeah. 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 That's great. That was brilliant. Well, thanks ever so much. And, Absolutely. Um, and all, all the best with what you're doing. Thank you. um, to say all this stuff is quite, quite important. I think. <laughs> yeah. Helping humanity, indeed. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. So hopefully we'll speak again soon. Absolutely. I would love to. That's great. Thanks ever right. so much. Bye. So thanks to Takara for her time. And um, obviously check out all of her stuff on the show notes. Um, I think this is a good reflection on the sort of impact that Stuart had on a lot of people Um because there are lots of very well-known writers uh, who had dealings with Stuart back in that sort of period of time. Um, and many of them actually don't sort of give sort of credit to him. Um, and this is part, partly really why I'm, I'm doing this series of um, podcasts. So, again, information on the show notes, obviously information about what I'm doing um, and if, if you want to help me on the Patreon, there's a lot of um, uh, bonuses on the Patreon site. I don't normally mention this on the um, on the podcast, but um, uh, stuff where you can be involved in the sort of annual P work that I do, um, and uh, obviously the teaching. There's sort of teaching f things for guitar and music, songwriting, and all the rest. So, until next time, I'll see you then. Bye. Mm -hmm.